All right. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to the second in our series of uh, great content review for a push uh, from the Bill of Rights Institute. We have a content specialist here today, Tom Ritchie. I'll tell you about him in a second. My name is Sean Redman. Uh, I work with and am representing the Bill of Rights Institute right now. Uh, I'm monitoring the chat, the live chat, and uh, getting your questions for our expert. Our expert, the man of the hour, is Tom. Tom is a Louisiana native. Tom teaches history and government classes in South Carolina. He has been teaching AP U.S. history since 2008. And since 2012, he's published AP U.S. history-related content on YouTube channel website and on his website, You'll find all that information here in the show notes uh, on the YouTube channel and everything there. So we are ready to go, ready to get you through that final hurdle and through the uh, A-push uh, testing. So let me hand it over to the man of the hour, Tom. Here we go. All right. Thank you, Sean. And, uh, you know, I always appreciate uh, such, an, uh, such an introduction. I need to do that when I'm on my own channel uh, doing these things. But, uh, but yeah, thanks so much. And thank you all for coming tonight. Now, I want to direct y'all's attention, uh, first of all, to the video description. Um, that's got a link to a Google document. You'll see me sometimes if there's a question I'm answering and I want to make a sudden graphic organizer or share some resources. Now, I believe that the Bill of Rights Institute has some of its own resources uh, here as well. Okay, so the Google Doc is basically what I'm using, uh, you know, when I'm sharing something suddenly, but also we've got some things here, some links to the Bill of Rights Institute. Now, also remember to follow the Bill of Rights Institute at uh, BRI Students on Instagram. Uh, they've got a lot of great content for students who are preparing for exams. Also, remember to come into the chat, okay, that the chat is where you'll be able to bring things to my attention if you want to focus on a certain thing, okay, you've got a specific question about something, or there are some things that I'll answer here, but remember Sean, who, uh, you know, introduced me with that great radio voice of his, um, that Sean is also answering questions in the chat, okay, so sometimes the chat will get kind of lively as this keeps going, so let's just, uh, you know, let's keep, uh, keep everything going, keep in the chat, I've got stuff that I'm going to cover during this. Now, remember also, this is largely a content-oriented workshop. Now, we're going to get into some skill-based stuff, but remember the Bill of Rights Institute, if you'll scroll through their channel videos, they're going to have some things for you that, uh, you know, that they've done some skill-based workshops with um, Daniel Joes from Joes Production. So with that, oh, great. We got some uh, folks coming to us from our uh, represent New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, Illinois, and Indiana, among other states. So first thing I'm going to do here, we're going to be focusing on the American Revolution. I feel like the Unit 3 is such a massive uh, unit, and it's been a little while since we've been there. So what I'm going to do here is divide this into the American Revolution, and then next time, uh, you know, which is tomorrow, because we're here pretty much every night until the exam, except for Friday and Saturday, um, that I'm going to focus on tomorrow, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, Articles of Confederation, um, Jefferson versus Hamilton, and all that. So with that, let's go ahead and get into this, you know, again, focusing on the American Revolution and beginning with the French and Indian War as a turning point. Now, I'll let you know that I have a full lecture on this on my YouTube channel. This is available on my YouTube channel. We might add that to the Google Doc, or you can just search for the title of this video if you want something a little more thorough. The French and Indian War as a turning point. Now, let's go ahead and note here the purpose of a colony is to make a profit for the mother country. And yesterday we mentioned mercantilism, okay? Mercantilism is going to be something that's very important to understand for units one through three. You know, anytime through the American Revolution, mercantilism is important. Now, some of you, if you took AP European history before this, you went a little deeper into mercantilism, which is a system of economic regulation. Now, for U.S. history, what you want to understand, and a lot of this is about relating things, okay? Okay, so the idea of mercantilism is that you are discouraging foreign trade, okay? You're discouraging trade with other nations, and you're trying to create basically an insulated economy um, with British colonial possessions and the British mother country. So 
for example, you know, in Britain, now this is the beginning, you know, the you know, Britain is manufacturing goods. And so British manufactured goods are going to be sent to Africa. They're going to be sent to the Americas. Um, and then the Americas are supposed to make raw materials. This is that Atlantic trade or triangular trade where, you know, the colonies are producing raw materials. The mother country is producing finished goods, okay? And then you've got, uh, you know, finished goods being traded to Africa and to the New World. And then the Middle Passage, uh, where slaves are being exchanged for, uh, you know, for these finished goods, uh, often from Europe, and going to the Caribbean, where the sugar economy is happening. So for example, Britain, uh, you know, the most, uh, you know, the most famous uh, British sugar island is Jamaica. So basically, if you're in the 13 colonies, you're getting your sugar from Jamaica, and you are trading raw materials, uh, you know, with uh, with the mother country. So with that, making sure that you understand how the Navigation Acts play into this. Now, the Navigation Acts basically were passed in the 17th century to govern trade and to discourage trade with other countries, with foreign ports. So what we want to note here is that before the French and Indian War, and again, the French and Indian War is a turning point, the Navigation Acts were not enforced, okay? And that's something to note, what we call salutary neglect. Um, salutary neglect is basically like, it's good neglect, okay? It's like if you're six and your parents leave you alone for the weekend with a $100 bill and tell you not to break anything, that's not so good. If you're 16 and your parents leave you alone with a hundred dollar bill for the weekend and tell you not to break anything, then that's a little bit more appreciated. That's like salutary neglect. You know, we think that you can uh, you can stay alone by yourself and we trust you to kind of mind your own business and, you know, to be able to do your thing. But the thing is, so the colonies, you know, Britain is trying to promote trade, okay? They're trying to promote trade and there, there aren't very many British troops, okay? And on the other hand, you've got New France, which we were talking about the colonies last night. So with this, now, this is getting into, we did a lot of comparison yesterday, and this time we're going to go more into causation, okay? So with this, thinking about the before the French and Indian War, the Navigation Acts were not enforced, this period of salutary neglect. Now, when we talk about the DBQ, the DBQ kicks in right now. The French and Indian War is the earliest, that's where DBQ territory starts. So you will not have a DBQ that is before the year 1754, but this is where we get into historical context. Remember, if you're writing a DBQ, then you know, you're thinking, okay, it may be on the American Revolution, but if you've got a DBQ on the American Revolution, which is about the earliest we could see, then this is going to be contextual goals. Now, my preference is for contextualization to draw your contextualization from the period immediately before uh, the essay, because that way you're not going to take away from your outside evidence, okay? So this is one of those things, make sure that you understand that if you're getting a DVQ about the American Revolution, this is usually going to go into your historical context. And so as far as what did the war change, the war put the British into debt, okay? And basically the British, which actually, you know, we're Americans, uh, so we can't really like say that the British had a point, but in a way they kind of did. Uh, you know, this is one of those things that the colonists had not been able to fight the French on their own. Like the only thing that turned um, the French and Indian War around is when the British sent in their British regulars. That is the decisive battle um, of, uh, you know, in, in Quebec. And so this is, uh, you know, General Wolfe, the British General Wolfe, who died uh, in this battle after achieving victory. But before, uh, you know, before the British sent their, you know, active duty units, uh, you know, they were, you know, the colonists were really just not doing that well. So the French and Indian War is the end of salutary neglect. It is also the beginning of a British troop presence. And now the Navigation Acts are suddenly going to be enforced because the British government is in debt. They need revenue. 
they're not trying to encourage trade so much as to pick up revenue. So this is what things are looking like afterwards. And of course, with this, so that is the end of salutary neglect, the beginning of a really unnecessary British troop presence because there are no more French, you know, the British get all of this uh, land here. And so with that, we want to think about short term versus long term, you know, immediate consequences. We're seeing tension between the British government over, I like to use, uh, you know, words that start with the same letter sometimes for alliteration, taxation, troops, and trade. Okay, taxation, troops, trade. And so immediate, you've got tension long term over this next 13 years, the American Revolution. So remember when you're thinking about immediate consequences versus long term consequences. OK, got it. Yeah, I can uh, I can certainly uh, certainly work on that. And so with that, uh, you know, going through, uh, you know, going through here, um, let's see where we uh, where we are here. So with that, remember, if you've got any specific questions, y'all, uh, you know, y'all let me know about those. OK, definitely like to do some interactive uh, Q&A type stuff. And like I said, what I just showed you is also available on my YouTube channel. But I think that's one of the big themes here. OK, so going from there, we want to think about you know, there are all of these events that are leading to uh, the Revolutionary War, okay? So that's something when we're thinking about the road to the American Revolution. Now, most of y'all, um, okay, so when I think about, uh, you know, the goal of trade and revenue. So the point I'm making about trade and revenue is that basically, you know, the economy, when we think about this, like, you know, when you raise taxes, this can kind of take us all the way to Ronald Reagan, for example, okay? So when you think about Reaganomics, uh, you know, agree with it or not, but the premise is of Reaganomics is that when you cut taxes, now Andrew Mellon did something very similar in the 1920s, is the theory that when you cut taxes, you actually will end up raising revenue because there is a more vibrant economy. And so, but the thing is, the way that the British were thinking after the French and Indian War, we've got to get some revenue, okay? We've got to get the colonists need to pay in so that they can, you know, so that we can, you know, actually pay off some of this debt. Now, as far as that, when we get into, you know, Reaganomics and other ways of looking at things, you know, Adam Smith, for example, you know, free trade is the best way to um, stimulate the economy, resulting in more taxes. But that's not how they're seeing it at the time. So with that, uh, you know, we see that the British are cracking down on on their, you know, on their regulations. And so going from there, you know, we've got to think about where we're thinking about getting into the American Revolution. And those of you who are going to make a five, Y'all may be in a position where you're like, I want to know everything that's leading up to the American Revolution. Like, I want to know all the taxes. I want to know all of this stuff here. Now, as far as this goes, I go into this. I've got a couple of videos in my channel, one of them called Parliament Taxes the Colonies and the other one called The Road to Revolution. OK, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, let me run in here. And when we're looking through here now, again, uh, you know, if you have any specific questions, uh, you know, please uh, be sure to let me know about that. OK, so ask your specific questions in the chat. But I'm going to go ahead and kind of strategize here when we're thinking about about uh, what's happening in the French and Indian War. Salutary neglect is gone. Now, the proclamation line of 1763 is something worth knowing. It's not something that actually caused a whole lot of outrage at the time, but I think it's something that when you, when you tie this together with what's already been, and what will come later, okay? Because remember yesterday when we were talking about uh, the British, you know, they're coming in in droves. The British are sending droves, just, just so many colonists. And these colonists, they don't want to just trade with the natives. They want to farm. They want to raise, uh, you know, they want to raise crops. And they want to, you know, in the South, they want to raise these cash crops that tend to exhaust the soil. Now, when we're talking about time periods, we want to differentiate between between the colonial and early national period where tobacco will be the primary cash crop, tobacco and then some rice and indigo in South Carolina. But tobacco, um, and remember the Chesapeake colonies, okay, where we see Virginia and Maryland. So tobacco, rice, indigo, whereas it's going to be um, after, you know, 1800, 
where we're going to see the prevalence of the cotton gin, okay, which is going to make cotton the big cash crop of the 19th century, okay, somewhere from about 1820 um, to the 1860s, you know, cotton is going to be this major cash crop. So you want to make sure that when you're thinking about historical periods, uh, that we know that, uh, you know, tobacco is eventually going to yield to cotton as the, you know, most, pro you know, the most profitable cash crop. But when we think about this, the British colonists, they've been moving west. And of course, the French and Indian War was partly caused by uh, these British colonists going into the Ohio River Valley. You know, they're wanting this fertile land, but this is land claimed by France. Now, after the French and Indian War, British colonists are thinking, hey, the British have got all of this land here. But what ends up happening is that uh, the British say, this is going to be reserved for um, the Indians, okay? So this is going to be somewhere we're going to basically not allow British colonists to go west of the Appalachian Mountains. So there is definitely some disappointment here. Like I said, this isn't creating a lot of outrage at the time, but we want to think about what's already happened and then think about manifest destiny later on, okay? So when you think about the American Revolution, this is something that is you know, that is somewhat a, you know, that is going to, you know, just kind of rein uh, these colonists in. And it's one, it's the first regulation that we see here. Okay. So the British are just in general passing rules for the colonists when they'd had kind of a free for all before the French and Indian War. Now, quartering troops, this is one of the big things. So when you're thinking about this, uh, when we're thinking about the causes of the American Revolution, taxation, trade, troops. Um, I would also say tradition, okay? That would be something, again, when you think about tradition, things like the Magna Carta um, and the English Bill of Rights that protected, as the colonists saw, that they had a right to their representative assemblies and they had a right to, uh, you know, basically to consent to taxation. That goes all the way back to the Magna Carta. And so looking at this, this whole idea of taxation by consent, this is a traditional belief. Now, we want to distinguish, and we don't necessarily need to distinguish too much, but it's good to know the difference between like appealing to traditional belief, but also having the enlightenment. I mentioned the enlightenment last time, which is focusing on the government as a protector of individual rights uh, and including the right to consent to taxation, the right not to, you know, have troops quartered among you during peacetime. Um, so that's something there that you want to think about the big, the big themes here. Um, but Parliament, now this is a Monet, but I love this one. You know, he did a lot of paintings of the Houses of Parliament. And I've always thought this one looked kind of like Mordor on Lord of the Rings. Uh, you know, so I always use this one when I'm trying to make Parliament look kind of sinister, you know. And so here's the thing that what we want to understand. Now, you could, if you're trying to make a five, you could go into, you're like, hey, I want to know all about the Sugar Act, all about the Stamp Act, all about the Townsend Acts. But the main idea here is that the Stamp Act is in the middle of this. And note that I've got the Stamp Act um, a bit uh, reddish here for a reason, because this is something that is different, okay? Now, while all of these taxes were unpopular, we want to note that the Sugar Act and the Townsend Acts, these were import taxes, okay? Now note, these are all in the 1760s. So again, you don't necessarily need to be thinking about like 1760 what? I would just say 1760s. All of these happened between 1763 and 1770s, 7070s. So in the 1760s, we don't really have a revolution as much as a tax revolt, okay? And so while none of these are popular, the Stamp Act was the least popular because it taxed the colonists directly, okay? It taxed the colonists directly. And so this is basically what happened is while colonists didn't necessarily like the Sugar Act and the Townsend Acts, they didn't really argue with it. It's kind of like if your parents, uh, you know, you got in trouble at school or something like that and your parents ask for your cell phone or for your car keys. You're not going to like this, but you're also not going to question your parents' right to take away your cell phone, to take away your car keys. After all, these are things that belong to them that they allow you to use, okay? So you, would, you wouldn't like it, but you wouldn't necessarily 
argue, you know, I mean, you'll argue a bit, but you don't feel like they don't have the right to do this. Whereas if your parents said, okay, well, uh, you know, you, I don't like your grades, so you're going to sleep outside for a week, okay, and we're not going to feed you. Now, your parents don't have a right to do that, okay? So as a minor in the United States, you don't have a lot of rights, but you have the right to food, clothing, and shelter, okay? For, you know, you have a right to expect that from your parents. And so the Stamp Act, what it did is it created a direct tax on the colonists saying that they have to anything, any legal documents, any kind of legal documents and certain paper products such as playing cards had to be printed on stamp paper. Okay, so you had to go and buy the stamp paper and you had to collect the tax. Now, funny story, I went to I went to Pakistan uh, over my spring break, Pakistan, which is a former, uh, you know, British imperial possession. And when I was going over there, there were some people that uh, that knew me through YouTube and said that they would be willing to write a letter inviting me to the country to help my visa application. And guess what this letter had to be printed on? It had to be printed on stamp paper. And I said, oh my goodness, this is so funny. But, uh, you know, my Pakistani friends didn't really understand what was so funny about this. But I said, we don't have this in the United States. You know, this would be something that was offensive, you know, if you had to go and say, hey, I need to go buy this special paper because it caused such an uproar. But former, uh, you know, British imperial, uh, you know, for, you know, British Commonwealth countries like still use this. I mean, this is still an acceptable way in some places to collect taxes. But the thing that happened with the colonists is they said Parliament does not have a right to tax us directly without the consent of our legislatures. Now, when we're thinking about this, one misconception that always needs to be cleared up. The, the colonists did not want to be represented in Parliament, okay, because that wouldn't have really done much for them, uh, because they would have been a minority interest in Parliament. So they're not wanting to be represented in Parliament, but what they're saying here, kind of like the Constitutional Convention met. And then in order to be ratified, the Constitution had to uh, receive approval from a certain number of states. And so what the colonists said that their rights are under the Magna Carta, the ability to consent to taxation, that they, before they're taxed directly by parliament, that their legislature should consent to the taxes. Parliament said, no way, okay? You are colonists, you are virtually represented in parliament, which I tell you, after like the pandemic, I think that gets even funnier, the idea of like virtual representation, right? I mean, being in a classroom virtually is just as good as actually being in class, right? I mean, that's basically what Parliament is uh, is saying, which hopefully y'all are, uh, you know, getting a little bit out of this virtual presentation here, huh? But Parliament, you know, the majority faction in Parliament contended, we have the right to tax the colonies because everybody in the British Empire is virtually represented here, even if you're not literally represented. So that's why the Stamp Act, be, you know, became so... Uh, you know, so toxic. Okay. So on one hand, you know, you got the Sugar Act and import tax. You got a few things going on there. But the Stamp Act, you know, this is something here where this is what the stamp paper would have this, uh, you know, would have this stamp on it. And then we see here that this is where we start to see mass resistance in the form of not only boycotts, but also, uh, you know, in the form of mob violence. Okay. This is something that there was, you know, it wasn't just, oh, will boycott the British goods, but it was also, will intimidate the British tax collectors. Uh, you know, we will, and this is something you see some of these things in, you know, pop culture, you know, there's Easy e in the 1980s, which this is a response to, and of course, you know, those of you growing up now, y'all don't remember what it was like, like growing up in the 19, you know, only like 80s and 90s kids will understand uh, what it was like be, not be, you know, being in high school 
and not being able to buy a, a CD, a tape or a CD, if it had an explicit lyric stamp. You had to be at least 17. Now, of course, today, now that music is digital, this really is something that's kind of come and gone and y'all just listen to whatever y'all want. But, you know, when they made these explicit lyric stamps, uh, you know, in the 1980s that were targeting, uh, you know, typically like for, for the most part, like rap and heavy metal albums were the targets of these campaigns. But, you know, you see here where Easy e is using the stamp, you know, he's using this imagery to protest against the explicit lyric stamp on albums that were designed to keep uh, young people from buying them. So no taxation without representation. Now, remember, representation in their legislatures, not parliament, okay? They don't want to be represented in parliament. So with that, we'll note how the Sons of Liberty are showing up. And note here, as I said earlier, um, that this is not just like, oh, we'll boycott British goods, but also, you know, we will intimidate the tax collector. Now, when we look at this source analysis, this is something that's very interesting, okay? Because when you think about the POV, who did this? Um, we see here a Liberty tree. Now, during the uh, you know, in this time, like the Sons of Liberty, they would uh, they would gather around either a Liberty tree or a Liberty pole. But you notice where the cartoonist here is, uh, you know, is putting a noose on the tree to suggest lawlessness. OK, so basically we see this and then we see the tarring and feathering, which looks really funny, but. This is now this, you know, the, the HBO John Adams series, which would be a great, uh, you know, a great thing to watch for anybody who is reviewing for an exam like this, because it basically takes you through the American Revolution and early national America. Uh, they've got a very graphic tarring and feathering of someone um, that really, you know, it looks like all fun and games here, but it's like it's so vivid that I can't even show it in class. OK, but you think about like they're putting hot tar and in order to heat you know in order to get tar in the liquid form you've got to heat it okay so i mean this is something that you know this is this is something that was going to uh, put somebody in uh, you know on bed rest for some days i mean this is something like his skin is burning and probably the top layer of it getting peeled off i mean so you notice here that the colonists look at the looks on their faces you know they are presented as lawless and then we see here here, the tea being dumped into the harbor here. So this is, we can see here that this is obviously a British or a British sympathizing point of view that, you know, saying that the Sons of Liberty are actually promoting lawlessness and they're not promoting, uh, you know, freedom. So then, you know, you've got the Sons of Liberty and then the Daughters of Liberty. They're making homespun fabric. Now, homespun, basically, they are trying to disrupt this colonial economy, okay? Because remember, this is based on the colonies providing raw materials and then purchasing British goods. So by making homespun fabric, this is one of those things kind of like, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, some people I know, they like to go to uh, the thrift store, like just, just for fun. Like they look, they like to see like, you know, what do I, what can I find here as far as some cool clothes? Um, and they're doing that because they, you know, they just, they like it from a fashion perspective. They're not even trying to save money or anything. They just like, uh, they like the look. And the Daughters of Liberty, it becomes trendy for even with someone, even someone like George Washington, who was one of the richest people in the colonies at the time, that George Washington suddenly, he doesn't want to be seen in a fancy custom tailored British suit. He wants to be seen in a suit made out of homespun cloth that, OK, obviously this is something that uh, was not an expensive British suit. And so this becomes a thing to resist the stand back. Now, notice here. Um, and then this is basically like we're going to gather to hear the resignation of the stamp collector. Now, the resignation of the stamp collector that we have intimidated and made uh, basically afraid for his life um, if he continues to collect the stamps. And so this is something that, you know, they're like, we're gathering to hear the resignation. Now, note here where I'm going into, I'm 
focusing a lot on the Stamp Act because this is something that is going, you know, you want to, instead of trying to memorize the whole timeline and thinking, okay, this happened here, that happened there, this happened this year, that really being able to delve into a few things that are leading up to it, this is something that I think is, uh, you know, is extremely important, okay? And so with that, again, the Townsend Acts, parliaments, you know, they repeal the Stamp Act because now not so much out of being afraid of the colonists, but it was actually British manufacturers. They are lobbying parliament. They're saying, look, like we're not able to sell things and like we need the colonists to consume our, our stuff that we're making. And so this really did do a job of successfully disrupting the British economy. Now, another thing I want to note is when we're talking about Jefferson's Embargo Act, like you know, oh, this cursed oh, grab me. You know, Jefferson's Embargo Act, Jefferson had been through this economic coercion before. So Jefferson believed that, you know, let's just try that again. Now, it didn't end up working that time, but it had worked with the Stamp Act. You know, Jefferson thought that the, you know, that embargo was going to, uh, you know, send a clear message to the British, just like the Stamp Act had. And so with that, again, the Townsend Acts, paper, paint, lead, glass, tea, unless you're trying to make a five, probably not something you need to hold, you know, you need to know a whole lot about necessarily. So with that, let's go ahead and take another, uh, you know, take another look, uh, look here. And so, uh, you know, so going with that, okay. And again, y'all remember, we can definitely, uh, you know, get into the chat and ask some questions, okay. I'm very fond of questions, uh, you know, and that sort of thing. So let me just, uh, let me run in here, uh, in here real quick. I'm going to, uh, okay. So I've got something here on the intolerable acts, okay? But I've got it. Uh, I still haven't, for whatever reason, put this on my website. Uh, but I've got this in the form of a Google document that I'll go ahead and put into, uh, you know, into the main Google Doc here. Um, we'll go ahead and put this into, uh, you know, handout, you know, so basically, uh, you know, session resources. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put a little link, uh, a little link to that. And this is the intolerable acts. Okay, now, so so with that, I would say that when you're thinking about this, um, the Stamp Act, the Boston Massacre and the Intolerable Acts. Okay, I would say that those three things are all very, very important in understanding uh, in understanding what's uh, you know what's going on. So with that, let me just uh, let me go ahead and share again. And remember, y'all feel free to get involved in the chat. We definitely want to take your questions if y'all got any uh, specific questions for us. So from there, you know, going into this, uh, you know, thinking about you know troops landing in Boston. And then we see here the Boston Massacre, okay, which of course, uh, we've got this, uh, you know, this propaganda. Now, when we're thinking about visual sources, visual sources have a POV as well. And so we've got to consider Paul Revere, who was a Boston silversmith and a member of the Sons of Liberty, someone who was not, uh, you know, a big fan of the British. And so when the Boston Massacre happened, when British troops were being, excuse me, were being harassed and threatened by this angry mob of colonists, like mostly like dock workers that were wielding clubs and, you know, were throwing like ice and snowballs and not like innocent snowballs. You know how, you know, you've got snowballs that you're like, oh, okay, there you go. Ha ha. And then you've got like, I'm going to pack this thing and make it like a bit of ice, okay? And then I'm going to throw it. That's the kind of thing. And they are, you know, calling the soul, you know, it's nighttime. Now note here in this propaganda piece by Paul Revere, he puts a moon in the very top corner, but it's kind of out of the way. And so, you know, we see here where Paul Revere has basically made it look like these troops just kind of marched in here. They're lined up. Everything's neat. The captain is raising his sword, ordering to fire. Um, conveniently, see, there's the butcher's hall. OK, so, I mean, this is something we need to be able to note this as 
propaganda. You know, these folks are, they look very innocent. We see some women and children there um, where, you know, really this would have been, you know, mostly, you know, grown men, a lot of whom were probably inebriated. But this is a bit of propaganda. And noting that, you know, that basically Paul Revere is trying to make the British look as bad as possible. Now, for your historical context, you would note that in, uh, in the trial, nearly everyone involved in the Boston Massacre, including Captain Preston, was found not guilty, okay? So this is something that there were a couple of guilty verdicts um, from some, uh, a couple of them who fired directly into the crowd, um, but most of them, uh, it was not guilty. And so this definitely portrayed the situation as something that it was not, in order to uh, make a political point. So remember that visual sources are not objective. And in fact, you know, visual sources, I think that people tend to just take those in more than they would text or words. It's like they look at this and if they weren't there, this is the impression that they're getting. Like, whoa, look what happened. And it's really hard to undo that. So from there, you know, we go into the, uh, yeah, I always uh, remember uh, Harambe there. Uh, you know, so with that, you know, the Towns and Acts are repealed. And then we've got this whole thing here. Now, note the cause and effect relationships, okay? The Tea Act leading to the Boston Tea Party, which led to the Intolerable Acts, which leads to the First Continental Congress, okay? And remember that during the French and Indian War, one of the reasons the British had to come get involved is uh, the colonies rejected the Albany Plan of Union. Remember, Benjamin Franklin made that, uh, that snake join or die. And and that's, uh, you know, and basically he's like, look, I mean, but the colonies were like, we don't want to cooperate. But the intolerable acts put the colonies into a position where they said, you know what, we want to cooperate. That wouldn't be so bad to do that. Now, one of the biggest misunderstandings of the Tea Act, OK, is that people think it was a tax. The Tea Act was not a tax. It was a monopoly. OK, so the Brit, the parliament, they had their friends in the British East India Company who were like, hey, we've got this tea piling up in our warehouses. and uh, you know, we can't sell it. And the British are like, you know, the parliament's like, you know what? Well, we'll cut the taxes and that will let you sell your tea in the colonies and maybe it'll cut down on smuggling. OK. And so, of course, one of the biggest smugglers in the colonies at that time was a guy named John Hancock. OK, so so as far as that goes, you know, where we're looking at, uh, you know, at this, you know, parliament is granting a monopoly to the British East India Company. And so that is leading to the Boston Tea Party. Just one second. I think the uh, the sun's gone down a little bit. Just going to adjust my my lighting just a little bit. It was washing me out earlier, but I think I kind of, you know, now that the sun's not shining directly in the window, um, this works a little better. So the Boston Tea Party, which is basically a, you know, Sons of Liberty led, uh, you know, vandalism of uh, tea that rightfully belonged to the British East India Company. Um, but with that, that results in the intolerable acts. Okay, now when we're thinking about something like this, um, let's uh, let's consider. And some of y'all are here in the Google Doc. Now there is a link here. Uh, you know, when you go into the session notes, you can click there in the intolerable acts. Um, I will go ahead and share as well in the. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, anyone with link can view. So I'm going to go ahead and also throw that into the chat for those of y'all who are, uh, you know, who are here. And so let's go and do that. But if you're watching this on the archive, go to the Google document in the description, and you'll be able to access this resource um, that I've got available through Google Drive that, you know, for whatever reason, I just have not put on my website yet. And so with that, when we're thinking about something like the Intolerable Acts, again, it's much better, um, rather than trying to memorize an entire timeline, it's much better to think about trying to become an expert in a few of these things. Know that the other things happen. Know the cause and effect relationships, but also, uh, you know, know some specific things about one of these things. So I go into the historical context and what's going on with uh, the T Act and what the T Act was. Okay, and so when it comes down to it, a lot of colonists they were resentful because by giving the British East India Company um, this, uh, you know, this preferential kind of thing here, that it is cutting down on the revenue of smugglers like you know John Hancock. 
Hancock who were bringing in, uh, you know, who were bringing in smuggled tea and the like. So from here, you know, we see what's going on. And I think that context is so important. Like if you really understand something, then part of that is that you want to, you know, you want to show that you understand what is around it. Okay. You want to understand what's around it. Now, then what we want to think about is, you know, as we're going through this, we're thinking about like the five different parts of the intolerable acts. Now, you don't necessarily need to know, um, you know, all five parts of the intolerable acts, but at the same time, if you can focus on a few of them, okay, so you focus on a few of them here, like, you know, first of all, like, and then the Boston Port Act. It's great if you know the Boston Port Act, but you don't know, it's not as, as, as important to know the name of the act as what it did and the impact of it, okay? So I would say here, as I'm going through here, if you know all five provisions, great, but it would be better to know two of them well than to just be able to name off all five. So, you know, decide what do you want to do? You know, what do you want to become an expert on? So especially when we get into the constructive response, you know, for those of you who are, uh, for those of you who are taking the exam on paper pencil, you know, y'all are gonna have to write an LEQ, basically your own essay from scratch using all of your own evidence. And even in that situation, it is the depth of your knowledge, okay, rather than the breadth that is going to be most important. So the main thing is, if you know all the information on this sheet, great. But the main thing is to figure out, you know, the cause and effect, what brought this about, what did it have in it, and then what were the effects, okay? And it's similar for the Compromise of 1850. I think the, the Compromise of 1850 is another one where, you know, if you're, th you know, if you understand that, you know, the Fugitive Slave Act, okay, and popular sovereignty in the Mexican session, that is going to be much better if you can talk intelligently about those things than knowing all of it. Okay. So as far as that goes, uh, these would be the two most important, I would say, but then also some things like the Quebec Act, which is um, something that basically while Parliament was passing restrictions on the 13 colonies, um, you know, Parliament is, uh, you know, is actually granting Quebec greater autonomy, even allowing Quebec to uh, collect taxes for the Catholic Church. And remember that anti-Catholicism is a, uh, you know, is a big theme in U.S. history. I mean, it's just, you know, Catholics today uh, make up the largest single religious denomination, you know, about 25 to 30 percent percent of Americans identify as Catholic today, but at this time, uh, very, very few, you know, less than 5% um, of colonists would have identified themselves as Catholic. And so with that, looking at the effects, okay, understanding that the Intolerable Acts led to the First Continental Congress. And so this is something that, uh, you know, they're boycotting British goods again, petitioning the king, and this is a key step in the colonists eventually gaining their independence. Now, then the battles of Lexington and Concord in 1775, that's going to be another thing that is going to happen. And that's going to result in the Second Continental Congress. Now, of course, then Thomas Paine is like, hey, what is it, uh, you know, what are y'all, uh, what are y'all doing? Y'all need to actually declare independence. And so independence is declared in 1776. Now, the Declaration of Independence, it's going to be very important for you to understand that this is uh, the Declaration of Independence is, first of all, addressed to King George uh, III, and then it is taking from the ideas of John Locke, okay? Now, I've got a lecture as well on the Declaration of Independence, which is actually targeted toward um, our state exam, but it makes all of these key points here, that when we think about the Declaration of Independence was addressed to King George III. Uh, it stated grievances, uh, basically declare, you know, these are the reasons why we're declaring independence. And then when Jefferson writes that government exists for the protection of, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that he is drawing from John Locke, who John Locke is somebody who's bringing in both the British tradition and the tradition of the Enlightenment. John Locke is kind of the godfather of the Enlightenment, so to speak. And so looking at those things, that's, uh, that's going to be uh, extremely important here. So 
Um, so going from that, uh, you know, we get into the American Revolution. When we're looking at the American Revolution proper, one of the most important things that I'd note is the Battle of Saratoga. Okay, the Battle of Saratoga, um, which is a decisive battle where the British uh, surrendered, a British army surrendered um, to a uh, to a Patriot army, to the Continental Army, and that resulted in French assistance. Okay, so understand that without French military and financial existence assistance, we probably would not have achieved our independence from Great Britain. So that French assistance, uh, you know, was super clutch. Okay, so we want to understand that. Now, another thing that I'm going to get into um, is that, uh, let's see, this is something that I don't have a proper uh, YouTube lecture on yet. So in the Google document, I'm going to link a PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so I'm going to find this PowerPoint where I go into the legacies or the effects of the of the American Revolution. Okay, so when we're thinking about, you know, how did, um, you know, how did, the, what were the effects? Because we focus a lot on the causes and we need to think about what is it that, uh, you know, what is it that the American Revolution did? And this is kind of a lecture that's in progress that I think is, uh, you know, is mostly finished. But again, I've put that into my Google document. So let me go ahead and pull that off, pull that up, um, because that is something that I think is important that we want to think about in terms of what did the American Revolution mean? Okay, what when we think about continuity and change over time, how much did the American Revolution really impact American society? And then to what extent was it just a political revolution? You know, when we think about revolutions, we think about like political revolutions, or we think about revolutions that are social in the sense that they alter um, the society. And so with that, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to give this full lecture. We don't really have time for that, but I'm going to focus on a few key points here, okay? When we're thinking about what did the, what happened as a result of the American Revolution. And again, this PowerPoint is available in the Google Doc. So how much difference did it make? And so was the American Revolution simply a political revolution that resulted in a change in government? Or did it also result in meaningful changes in American society? And to what extent? So one thing that I like to show off, like notice there's Jefferson in Britain, 1786, just three years after our independence. Jefferson is being painted in a powdered wig. He's got big ruffles in his shirt. Now note here that when we look at Jefferson in the United States only five years later, there is Jefferson with his natural hair. Uh, no powdered wig. His ruffles are a little bit less, right? So Jefferson and Washington and other aristocrats, uh, they begin representing themselves differently. And that's where you look into the difference between a monarchy and a republic, okay? So there are a lot of things that happen. We think about republicanism. Now, small r, this has nothing to do with the political party. And so when we're looking at this, you know, this is basically there's not a king, the people rule, that sort of thing. And so when we think about egalitarianism, now take this G and turn it around and and you get equalitarianism, okay? So when we think about egalitarianism um, in a monarchy, you've got a fixed social hierarchy, whereas in a republic, you have equality under the law. So this is something that, you know, remember George Washington under the British monarchy, Washington was able to get a militia commission, but he could not get an actual regular army commission. And so George Washington, who's just like, look, I have more money than you. You know, why is it that I'm less important than you are? Um, and so this is one of the big things about the American Revolution is people like Washington and Jefferson um, and Adams are no longer less than just because they're colonists. You know, when Jefferson is writing, you know, all men are created equal. You know, his most literal meaning at the time uh, was saying that, you know, we are not less than you because we were born in the colonies, or we are not less than you because we don't have a title of nobility or don't come from an important British family. So you note here, our constitution says 
no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States. This is um, a nod to republicanism. We do not want to create uh, an official titled nobility. Um, so with that, now notice what it does to slavery. Now, before the American Revolution, slavery was legal in every single colony, all right? So every single colony had slavery to some extent before the American Revolution. Now, we see by 1800, nearly all states north of the Mason-Dixon line, and just for some of y'all who've heard this term before, this is the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania. The Mason-Dixon line is the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania, which in, uh, you know, in the, you know, colonial times and in the antebellum times, you know, as you go through early national and antebellum history, now Maryland People wouldn't generally consider Maryland Southern today, um, but at the same time, at that time, you know, this was the border between the free states and the slave states, um, the border between the North and the South. And so, you know, we see here that nearly all states north of the Mason-Dixon line passed laws providing for gradual emancipation of slaves. Now, note here that that does not mean that it's bringing in an era of equality. Very few northern states allowed free black men to vote. Some of them even prohibited uh, black Americans from living in those states, which they may not have enforced. But then when you see that even if it's not enforced, it's something that, hey, you know, you better make sure that, uh, you know, you don't get yourself into any trouble or tick off somebody important who will then get you kicked out of the state. So understand um, that while this is, uh, you know, we see the beginning of the end of slavery in the North, uh, you know, nowhere near the beginning of the end of white supremacy, uh, you know, in any part of the United States. And so with that, you know, you see that a lot of these, uh, the functional end of slavery tends to be in the 1840s in most of these states. And so meanwhile, we'll note that slavery became even more entrenched in the South, especially after the development of the cotton gin. Now, another thing that we note is that you know, while, uh, you know, while in the colonies, you know, while people came for religious freedom, um, it was only in Pennsylvania and a few other places where you could actually exercise full freedom of religion, um, whereas most states had an established church. So we see here that Jefferson wrote the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom in 1786, just a few years after the American Revolution, that disestablished the Anglican Church in Virginia. And so Said that everyone will, you know, no one is going to be compelled to worship or support any religious worship. You are free to profess your opinions in matters of religion. Now, 11 out of 13 states, uh, you know, disestablished churches, uh, you know, well, I guess Pennsylvania never had one. But as far as that goes, that only Massachusetts and Connecticut continued to have established churches for some decades after the American Revolution. So we see that the First Amendment, you know, free, freedom of religion, you know, it has its genesis here in the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. And so with this, uh, you know, and no religious test shall ever be required as a, call, as a qualification for any offices. So religious freedom is a consequence of this. Federalism, okay? So, you know, you see that the states had to cooperate to win the war. Now, after the war, the states don't really want to cooperate quite as much anymore. So tomorrow we'll talk about the Articles of Confederation. Um, but as far as that goes, that our system of federalism, where the states um, are together but separate, e pluribus unum. Um, so as far as this uh, this goes, when we look at the contributions of women to the revolution, uh, some people like Molly Pitcher and Nancy Morgan Hart, who's actually Hart County, Georgia, is driving distance from me. It's the only Georgia county name for a woman, um, this woman who, uh, according to the story, uh, there were some British soldiers who came to her house, insisted that she cook something for them, and she made them a nice meal, and then she shot them uh, with their own muskets. And there's a kid who made kind of a version of that, which I thought was really great. Um, so with that, as a result of the American Revolution, now, what we don't see, we don't see women's suffrage, um, even though Abigail Adams is writing to her husband, remember the ladies, um, that's not going to happen for quite a while, over a century, um, but, you know, until 1920. But as far as that goes, we want to note as well that uh, married women 
um, did not get property rights as a result of this. Like, you know, while a married woman could have some control over her land, um, her personal property was basically at the disposal of her husband. Now, Republican motherhood, uh, I need to update that when Sarah Palin's uh, been out of politics for a little while. It's not Repub the Republican Party. It's just this idea that a Republican woman should be very much involved in raising her children to be good Republican citizens. Now, this did not come with political rights, but did come with some advances in women's education. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, those are some things we want to think about also, you know, just these effects, okay, that we have of the American Revolution. Now, agrarianism, you know, Jefferson, big fan of agrarianism, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. More on that tomorrow, okay, and notice how, like, George Washington portrays himself, you know, very simply, you know, he doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to be portrayed as, like, a deity or something, you know, he projects himself as being very simple. You know, there he is pictured with a plow. He wants to be pictured as a simple farmer, not like a god or anything like this. This was an 1840 sculpture that wasn't received very well. And so with that, you know, he's portraying himself like Cincinnatus, a Roman, uh, you know, a Roman leader who voluntarily gave up power. Okay. So with that, and we'll talk about Washington's farewell address tomorrow. That'll be fair game tomorrow. This principle of rotation in office where George Washington not only gives up his commission, but also gives up the presidency, okay, after two terms. And so with that, we want to kind of think about to what extent did the American Revolution promote continuity, and to what extent did the American Revolution promote change? So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to remind y'all that we will be back every night uh, between now and the exam um, without, uh, you know, every night except for Friday and Saturday. So y'all just make Make sure that y'all, uh, you know, come back and hang out with us. And uh, with that, we'll uh, invite our friend Sean to, uh, you know, to let us out of here and give us the dismissal. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tom. At, uh, what a great time we have with you, uh, with Tom Ritchie, or as I like to call him, Mr. A-Push. I'm a fan. If you are not a fan of Tom's an hour ago, I bet you are now. Uh, boy, the Bill of Rights Institute is devoted to teaching U.S. history and preparing you for this a push test. Um, there are so many resources available on the website. Please check the video notes for resources, homework help, video reviews, uh, and much, much more. Tell your friends uh, to be here tomorrow with us. Uh, tell your enemies to be here tomorrow with us. Tell everybody uh, a great time is to be had. We'll be talking about the Constitution, as Tom said. Um, love it when you got a little light on questions tonight. We do love it when questions come in so that we can uh, propose those to our content expert, Tom Ritchie. Uh, other than that, thank you so much, guys. And come back tomorrow. 